Welcome back to another episode of Fearless. I am actually here in my office in Charlotte, North Carolina, at the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association. And so for those that are watching on YouTube, you can see I'm back in my office for the first time since having um, my little girl, Georgia Graham. And I will say, traveling again, it's a little more difficult to leave all three kids behind and for mama to get out the door. But we're here. I'm so thankful to be back in the office and with my team of Fearless. And I want to say thank you to all of those who have sent encouraging notes. But recently, I got a message on Instagram from a girl where— um, she had just said that she had listened to my most recent episode of Fearless and that she had been away from God for about 20 years, that she'd grown up in a Christian home and her dad had led her to the Lord when she was six, but pretty much walked away from him after high school. And she got married and had three kids. And then COVID hit. And she said, I started small, getting back into the word. And I found your podcast, which has really spoken to me and helped me see my need for Christ and my kids need for Christ. I have since led all three of my kids to the Lord, and we have found a wonderful church we belong to. Personally, I'm thankful you obey the Lord in the startup of your podcast. It really set me down the path of finding Christ again, and the peace I feel because of Him is exactly what I've longed for for almost 20 years. I guess that'll make me teary and a little bit of emotional because sometimes after recording a podcast, I'm like, oh, Maybe I did that wrong. Maybe I didn't say the right thing. And who wants to listen to that on their own personal time? So I'm so grateful for all of you who have sent encouraging notes, and especially ones like that, that my prayer is always that Fearless will encourage you and strengthen your relationship with the Lord for this crazy culture that we're living in and these days that we're facing. But as we're um, looking forward, these next two podcasts I'm going to do um, in these episodes are kind of conversations Corey and I have been having in our own home. And I know that we cannot be alone in having these conversations as we're trying to navigate navigate our family and how um, how we do this. We have this competition between sharing our screen time and how much time we spend on our phones to each other. And to be honest, that can kind of be a vulnerable thing to show how many hours a day you're spending on your phone. And um, it can qu be quite embarrassing and humiliating. So that's the conversation we've been having. And just as a side note, there was one day I lost that. I had more time than him, and I had to look. My clock, if your clock is running on your phone like your timer, it counts as screen time. So actually, when I deleted that, I beat him, and I had less screen time. We preach it to our kids all the time, like, be careful what we're looking at. Be careful of what we're doing. And I know as parents, we're trying to navigate, when do we get our give our kids a phone? What can, are they allowed to watch on TV? And that is so hard in the time period we're living in, 2023, when our jobs are on our phone, schoolwork half the time is on an iPad or a tablet and our computers. It's hard to navigate that. And my heart for this episode really also kind of I was challenged with the content that we're watching, but it really just kind of bloomed into more of the conversation of how much time are we looking at our phones and our TVs and the screens. And the book 4,000 Weeks by Oliver um, Berkman unpacks our relationship with time and how we use it. 4,000 weeks is 80 years, and that's the average lifespan of a human. And I think we have 4,000 weeks, that's 4,000 Fridays, 4,000 Saturdays, and 4,000 Sundays, which for some of us, you know, when I was talking to my producer here in the room, he's a little bit older than me. So his time has gotten a lot shorter. <laughs> but when you start thinking about that, and Oliver Berkman says, when you get to the end of your life, the sum total of all the things you paid attention to will have been your life. And I want to ask, what are we paying attention to when we spend an average, Americans spend an average of seven hours and four minutes on our phone a day. And I know this one's hard to navigate because it is our job, our emails, our job is on our phone, it's on our computer. Many of us are working from home. If our boss sends an email, we're expected to look at it at 10 o'clock at night and to respond to it. And so it's a really hard time to adjust. For an example, the other night at the dinner table, I'm really trying our rules not to have our phones at our table. And my husband picks it up and my son goes, uh-uh, no phones at the table. And it was something really urgent he had to respond to in that moment. So it's hard to find this. And so we're going to try to work through this together. 
But I said the average um, for Americans was seven hours and four minutes. And 41% of adults say they struggle with managing their screen time. And of course, I'm one of them. Sometimes it's just out of habit. Your phone's sitting next to you and you just pick it up and you just start scrolling on Instagram or you're looking on YouTube and researching something and you don't even realize you're doing it. And so I am one that struggles with managing their screen time and I'm trying to figure this out. But I think if you're Gen Z, your screen time averages nine hours per day. And that's not just, you think of how many hours they go to school, then nine hours in front of a screen, whether that's watching TV, that's gaming, that's their social media. And just today on my way to work on the radio, they were talking about a new study that just came out and the damage it's doing to teenagers as their brain is developing at a young age and it's having long-term effects um, being in front of a screen for so long. But experts say that we should spend less than two hours a day outside of work on our screens. And you think two hours, that's still a lot of time. And in a recent sermon, Craig Groeschel of Life Church in Oklahoma, he shared that if you spend four hours a day on your device for 60 years, you will have spent 10 years of your life staring at a screen. You think 10 years when we stand before God one day, and I'm not trying to like over spiritualize things, but God gives us time and we're to be good stewards of our time. And if we're to stand before God and say, 10 years I spent my life in front of a screen, looking at a stranger who lives out in Utah and their life on Instagram and what they post of their family. That's almost like a gut punch to me when I read that. I know the other day I was looking on Instagram of this family I love to follow. And my son, who's six years old, is looking at it with me. And he goes, Mom, why is she telling us all that stuff? And I looked at him. I said, you know, Austin, that is a really good question. I don't know why she's telling us all her personal information. Or worse, why is mom listening to it? And listening to it while my son is sitting right there. Um, But we all know life is fleeting, We talk about that all the time. There was this man that worked for my dad for many years, and he would pick me up from school sometimes. And he would, every time he would pick me up, he would say, oh, sissy, life goes by so fast. Enjoy these days, you know, and he's talking in his slow tone. And I can remember him thinking, life is long. I got a long time to live. And by the time you hit your mid-30s and your 40s, you start thinking, wow, I can remember when my parents turned 40 and life is flying by and it's fleeting. And we're spending so much of our time every day on our phones. In Proverbs 6, it says, Go to the ant, O sluggard. Consider her ways and be wise. Without having any chief, officer, or ruler, she prepares her bread in summer and gathers her food in harvest. How long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you rise from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. But let's think about this verse with the word, if you switched it to screen and you inserted the word screen into it. And it says, how long will you lie there, O sluggard? When will you arise from your screen? And when we look at our screen, one of the problems is it's not real life. A lot of these are fantasies we're looking at, whether they're real people and we're following them and they live out in Utah. We're still, we're comparing our lives. We only see the good parts of their lives. And it's a fantasy that we're chasing. And many times I think it can leave us to even coveting one another. You covet, you see these people's big, beautiful houses and you think that's what we should look like, a, a house that came right out of a magazine. And many times I can lie in bed and I'm looking on my phone And I can become discontent with what I have and what God has blessed me with. But it's not real life. And Proverbs 12 says, Those who work their land will have abundant food, but those who chase fantasies have no sense. And I think how often many of the nights we are um, looking at fantasies of other people's lives that are not even comparable to ours, but also of what we might be watching on Netflix and all the streaming services that we have out there now. But we have a responsibility to use our time wisely. And we also have the responsibility to set that example to our children. Um, The other day, we were doing Bible study devotions before we put our kids to bed. And we're talking about love is patient and love is kind. And my son, once again, six years old, goes, Mom, do you want to know when I'm not patient? 
I said, sure, tell me when you're not patient. And he says, when I'm trying to talk to dad and he's on his phone and I'll say something over and over and over and he looks up at me and goes, huh? I don't have patience for that, he said. (laughs) This is a six-year-old. And he didn't even know I was preparing this, of course, to, to speak on fearless. But we have a responsibility as parents to set that example, um, to use that time that God has entrusted with us with our own children. In Colossians 4, it says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of our time. And when I think about that, I think of how often we're just on our phone, whether we're walking in the parking lot, whether we're sitting in the line at the grocery store or walking through the mall, wherever we are, we're on our phones. We're looking down and how often we might be missing opportunities that God's putting in front of us to engage with somebody, to be an encouragement to somebody. I think I'm from the South and I grew up with a mom who talks to everybody. She doesn't meet a stranger. My brother Will does not meet a stranger. He will talk to you. If you're in the parking lot, he'll talk to you at the cash register, and he'll know your name by the end of it. But think now, we've become such an impersonal society and a culture, and we are not even engaging with the people that we are coming in contact with. We're just looking down at our phones, and it says we're to be making the best use of our time. And in Romans 13, it says, besides this, you know the time that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. For for salvation is nearer to us than when we first believed. The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the daytime. I want you to remember that. As in the daytime, we're to walk properly not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And that I want to lead into the content that we are watching, the content that we're looking at on our phones, the contents we're streaming, because how many, when we look at that verse, drunkenness, sexual immorality, orgies. When you turn on Netflix, every TV show now, the sexual content is horrible. Just the other day, I was turning on because I was going to watch an old show. And this new one that they were advertising, it was called Sex Life. And just the trailer, I didn't even have to click on it. The trailer starts um, playing before I can change it. And it is this TV show now that is going to be very gruesome about sex life, I think, within an office. I'm not really sure. That's what I kind of got from the trailer. But I remember this time I was watching this TV show, and I'll be honest, I was watching this show called Outlander. And if you're listening and you have watched Outlander, you know it's a horrible show. And I got sucked in because it was a historical kind of time piece, and I like shows that are a different time period. And there's this one scene that is absolutely horrible that I felt so uncomfortable that I had to fast forward through it. But then I kept still watching the show. And my husband came in one night, and I was watching on my iPad. And Corey looked at me, and he said, Sissy, would you be okay if I was watching on my iPad by myself in my bedroom watching that show? And I sat in silence. I couldn't put up an argument with him. He was right. I would absolutely not be okay if I walked in and my husband was watching this show that had these graphic sex scenes in it. And at that moment, I turned it off. And to this day, I've never watched that show again. And it was funny because I got to this point. I'd watched some pretty hard, even if it wasn't like sexual, maybe very violent shows that we see now that are on streaming. And I would wake up with this like darkness over me because let's... We all have now binge watched a show where we're just like, one more episode, one more episode. And before we know, it's 1 a.m. And we've watched four episodes. And we wake up. We hit the snooze button. We're waking up late. I'm not waking up to do my devotions. I can barely get out the door on time. I'm cranky with my children. And so it just has this impact throughout our day when we spend hours and hours of watching a show that's not even worthy, that that says we— um to walk as properly as we do in the daytime. And that's another thing. We're watching them late at night. We are watching them in our bedrooms. The content now is on. We don't have to be in some hotel room 
to have some pornography show right in front of us. It's on our streaming devices. It's on our phones. It's on our computers, iPads. It's at our fingertips. And we, as a culture, we have repackaged porn. We had these streaming devices and these services of high production value, these fascinating storylines of these characters that we can kind of relate to, these beautiful actors and actresses. It's not some like low quality thing that's being filmed in a dark alley anymore. These are right here on Netflix, on Hulu. Every show that you turn on has vulgar language, has horrible sex scenes, probably more than the first three minutes. I remember I turned on this show. Once again, it was a historical piece. And in the first three minutes, it was a full-on nudity sex scene. And I had to turn it off. And once we've seen those, it's kind of like what we've taught to our children about, you know, be careful little eyes what you see, because once you see it, you're never going to forget it. And that had an impact. I can remember being in a hotel room when I was like nine years old, just flipping through the channel, and of course, pornography popped in. But you don't have to be in a hotel room. We all have it at our fingertips now. And it's called a TV show. It's not pornography. And there's a a lot of TV shows that maybe you're starting to think of. And one of them is um, Yellowstone. Most of my friends watch Yellowstone. Most of um, my Christian friends have told me, hey, you need to watch Yellowstone. And I turned it on and The language was so bad. The F word was every five minutes. And probably the old sissy, I would have watched it and just kind of shook it off. But God has really convicted my heart. And that's why I'm here. I'm I'm just sharing it because I realized watching those things, the, the darkness that it would have and the impact on my life the next day, whether you realize it or not. Um, there's a reason that God warns us to be careful of what we're watching. And that's not just a, command to our children. We are to be careful what our eyes see and what we allow in our mind and our hearts. Um, It was funny because a couple, like a year ago or a couple years ago when God started convicting me of this, I was like, okay, what wholesome shows can I start watching? And I started watching Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. And then I put it on Instagram one time and everybody started laughing that I was watching this show from the 90s. But it was a show that I was allowed to let my kids watch. We didn't have to worry about what was going to be in the next scene. And we just have to be so careful. I think this is a tool that Satan is using in our culture, and it's slowly happening, and we don't even realize it. And because it's been repackaged, because it's TV shows, there's another one um, that I had turned on because everybody was recommending it. And it had a full-on sex scene. And one of my friends says, well, they were married. They were a married couple. And I'm like, so let's say if it wasn't packaged at this number one show on Netflix, and I'm just watching it as porn, and well, they're married. We're just watching. That's okay if I watch it. We are coming up with these excuses of why it's okay. But we just have to remember that it's all just been repackaged. It all has a new name now in our culture. Uh, Psalm 101 says, I will be careful to lead a blameless life. When will you come to me? It says, I will conduct the affairs of my house with a blameless heart. I will not look with approval of anything that is vile. And I was reading that the other day, um, just in my devotions, and I thought myself as a mom, I set that responsibility for my household, that I conduct the affairs of my house, and what am I going to allow in it? Even if it's behind closed doors and my children are not there, that has an effect of my daily life because it's sin and a sin is going to grow. And we think we, um, we think it won't have a negative effect. We're just watching it, but it is so powerful. Matthew six says the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is the darkness? And that's just something I personally experienced after watching some of these shows. As I said, I would wake up and it would just kind of be like this dark cloud over me um, because I had watched nothing worthy of my time. And that's just on the content But when we start thinking about how much time, when we're talking about watching a binge watching a show for four hours at night, and we think back of the quote that we would spend an average of 10 years of our life in front of a screen, how do we stand before God at the judgment of believers and say, Lord, I spent 10 years of my life 
watching filth, watching orgies, watching drunkenness, watching quarreling and jealousy, foul language, or even if I'm scrolling Instagram and I'm watching these strangers that have no purpose in my life, how do we stand before God and answer that? And maybe you're thinking, okay, sissy, this is, you're kind of over spiritualizing all of this. But no, it's true. And this is having a heavy impact on our culture. You think of the anxiety and the depression that we are facing. A lot of it is coming from the video games our children are watching, from the TV shows that they're watching. We know Hollywood is a mess. We know that they are indoctrinating our children with their ideologies. So why do we think it's okay that we watch it? We're allowing them to seep into our own hearts and our own minds. Um, And of course, like I said, it's all become private now. Nobody has to know we're watching it. No, And that's kind of how I felt when I was watching that show on my iPad, other than my husband. And my husband, and I'm so thankful for him saying that, he convicted me. And um, from that day, trying to be careful of what we watch as a family and what I watch by myself. And I kind of feel like a little bit of an old grandma or like my mom saying, be careful what you watch and maybe a little bit legalistic. But this is scripture that we're reading, you know, that we are, God commands us to be careful what our eyes look at. You see like the dangers of David just with his eyes of seeing Bathsheba and what that led to. But I'll never forget um, this man, an, an, an Irish man, he and his wife had spent their life on the mission field and he came to work for Samaritans. <clears throat> But I'll never forget when I was a little girl, there was this man, um, his name's Ed Morrow, and he and his wife had worked on the mission field for years, and he and his wife came to work at Samaritan's Purse. And I was watching TV one day, and he walks into the house, and he says, Sissy, what are you watching? It's like 10 years old. I said, oh, some TV show about witches. I think it was Charmed, like back in the 90s or something. And here, you know, looking back, he's coming off the mission field where witchcraft has such a heavy presence and a dark presence on the mission field. And we as Americans are just making light of witchcraft. And he goes, oh, sissy, you're watching that devil block. You should not be watching that devil block. And that's my horrible Irish accent, by the way. But I laugh now because it is so true how Satan has used the media. He's used these TVs. He's used these screens to infiltrate this content that is so against God. It is so against living a holy life. It keeps us from living a holy life. And in this world where we are continuing to face darkness and it is getting more and more difficult to take a stand for Jesus and to live in light, but then in return, We're filling our heart and our mind and our soul with complete darkness. And that is Satan using his power to infiltrate our hearts in the darkness of the night when we're watching on our screens. So that was a big part of the content. And um, maybe I could have done a whole episode on just the content of our screen time. But what if the screen time is a device the enemy uses to steal and to distract us from a vibrant, full life that Jesus gave us? Think about even with our spouse or with our friends, like I said, with my son. Um, the word now that they say is technoference. That's when um, technology-based interference is when you're trying to have a conversation or connect with a person, but you're on a device and the device is in between you. I can't tell you how many times I've sat in or I've lied in bed. My husband's on his phone. I'm on my phone. And we go to bed not even talking. He puts his down. I put mine down. And we haven't even had a conversation. And I think back when we first got married. I know. I've been married 15 years now. I'm getting quite old. But our rule was we wouldn't even have a TV in our bedroom because we want our bedroom to be a place where we could connect, we could have conversations, wind down the night, and it was just between the two of us. Well, then you got our first year of marriage, we got an iPhone. That's when the iPhones came out. And so you can start just scrolling on your phone um, before you go to bed. And then we get iPads. So then it was pretty much having a TV, even though I said, I don't have a TV in our bedroom. I had a TV with the iPad. And then COVID hit. And we had all this family time and my kids would, our, their favorite thing was to come get in our bed and we ended up putting a TV in our bedroom. So here we are, we got an iPad, a phone and a TV 15 years later. But Corey and I have been having this conversation of what this looks like for our family. What are some rules that we can set up? Because 72% of couples have um, 
reported the technoference uh, interactions in their partner in their in their relationships. Screen time can have a deeply negative impact on the amount um, and the level and the depth of conversations we're having with our loved ones. And it's like that story with Austin. He was trying to talk to my husband. And this is, of course, something that's happened repeatedly, enough for him to say he doesn't have patience for his dad. But I think the other night they were wanting to go to bed. And of course, I'm just scrolling on Instagram with no purpose, just watching the lives of other people. And I realized I had missed the opportunity to put my kids to bed. And if we think out of those 4,000 weeks we get to live, it's a very little amount of how much time we get to actually put our kids to bed. And I missed out on that. And I said, Corey, we got to get better of not even having our phone. So this is, of course, a conversation Corey and I are continuing, trying to figure out how this works for our family. So what can we do? How do we take back that time that we've allowed culture, we've allowed our social media, we've allowed these streaming services to steal and rob our time, and we're allowing culture um, to kind of shift our hearts and our minds, and Satan is using it in a mighty way. So how can we take our time back? And I would, number one, encourage you, Take an honest assessment of how much is on your screen. It's kind of like that conversation Corey and I were having. Show me your screen time. Look at it. It will, man, I guarantee it will be like just a punch to the stomach of how much time you're spending on your phone. Um, and there are some apps out there that I think help you with that. I have not downloaded them, but there are some out there if you need help. Um, but ask your spouse um, where he or she thinks that um, they're spending too much time. What are they watching? What's the content? Hold each other accountable. Come up with a plan. And you know what? If you're a woman listening to this, I want to be careful. We as um, wives sometimes can come up with these plans and these ideas in our head. And we're going to go to our husband and we're going to say, hey, we're going to do this. We're going to say no more time at this. And my husband's like, I'm not on board with that. Do it together. Because if it's not a partnership, it's going to go in one ear and out the other. And then maybe come up with some own rules for your family. Corey and I have been talking about maybe we have no screen time, no phone from 6 to 8 p.m. That's kind of the dinner time. It's the crazy time for young families when you're trying to get your kids in bed. My husband's trying to check his email and work on something, and we've missed devotion time because now it's too late. So really make those like 6 to 8 or 6 to 8.30 kind of a screen-free time where we're really focused on that family, where the family can come together at the end of the night. Um, and then maybe make some other rules for your family, whatever that may look like. I just wanted this episode to be an encouragement to you because we are to live a fearless life. And this whole purpose of this episode or this podcast, Fearless, is to help you live a fearless faith in a compromising culture. And one of the biggest places our culture has com compromised is in what we're watching, what we're listening to, the amount of screen time that we have given our time. Just think we're spending an average of over four hours a day, apart from work, on our phones. And our time is so precious. God gives us a little bit of time. And, and a lot of those days go by so fast. We're like, oh, it was so busy. I didn't even have time to pray today. Or I didn't even have time to do my devotions because I woke up so late because I was exhausted because maybe you watched a TV show. I just want to encourage you to pray about it, reassess where we're spending our time, Stop looking at your phone as much. Enjoy your family. Spend time investing into your children, into your um, relationships of those people around you. And not letting culture infiltrate our hearts and our minds with their filth and with their trash. And when I work on Fearless and y'all are listening to Fearless, that helps me stay focused of what God's purpose in my life and this season I have right now. And that's Fearless. And it's like the testimony I read that was sent in to me. And I'm so thankful for all of you who are listening. Although you are listening on your devices, I am aware of that. So I hope and I always use your time wisely with what God's put on my heart. And I want to encourage you, share fearless with your friends, with your families. Maybe these are things. I know Corey and I are not the only ones trying to navigate this. As our culture has shifted all to be on screens now, how can we have a healthy balance? <music>